Thank you to all the witnesses. This is certainly a stimulating uh, committee meeting. My first uh, question is for Mr. Sorensen. Mr. Sorensen, could you detail to us the funds that you've actually received from the federal government? Uh, yes. As of the as of December 31st, 2020, uh, Providence had received $878,182 from NRC and $350,000 from NGEN. Uh, thus far in 2021, we have received an additional $907,648 from the NRC. Uh, all told, Providence has received just over $2 million uh, cumulative as of today from the federal government. And you didn't receive any funding from the Strategic Innovation Fund? No. I have some information that apparently you did receive some 4.7 million at some point. That is a commitment through the National Research Council. Um, and I just articulated how much we've received of that commitment to date. But you were committed uh, a sum of some 4.7 million. Through the uh, National Research Council, correct, yes. Yes, and uh, following that commitment, what sort of data have you been required to submit to the National Research Council? We provide the National Research Council uh, regular updates on our progress uh, with regards to phase one clinical trial. Uh, we provided them the full package that was also submitted to Health Canada in which we received our authorization, authorization to proceed and we provided them full access to all of our preclinical data. And uh, uh, as you progress through uh, the various clinical trials, potentially or whatever, you will be submitting data as it comes in? Yes. And would you anticipate then further funding from the federal government? <clears throat> uh, it is our intention to proceed with the National Research Council and with the uh, Strategic Innovation Fund uh, to invite them to participate in sponsorship of phase two and phase three clinical trials. Uh, however, that is not necessary for us to proceed. It seems like it's a responsible process to me. Uh, in other words, you submit data and then there's a further commitment of funding. And it seems to be decision-making based on science, which I'm sure is music to uh, uh, Professor Ataran's uh, ears. Uh, I would like now to turn to uh, Dr. Lexgen. Uh, Dr. Lexgen, you mentioned compulsory licensing. Could you please explain exactly what you mean by that and how it would work? Sure. Um, first of all, let me point out that back in the early days of the pandemic, um, Parliament passed Bill C-13, which did allow compulsory licensing for a period of time, but that expired in at the end of September of 2020. So compulsory licensing in essence means that um, the government can issue a license to another company to make a product which is still under patent. So in that way you can expand the um, production capability and you also perhaps can get competition in terms of price. Um, thank you for that. So, Mr. Casey, uh, perhaps uh, you could give us your opinion on compulsory licensing. I presume this has been a discussion with the many members of your organization. Well, it has. I mean, I think Canada has recognized it's been a globally competitive industry, and so you have to adopt policies that are actually going to allow the industry to compete globally and, and to also participate here. I think it's part of why we've seen a little bit of the industry disappear in Canada. I think we um, have uh, adopted pricing policies that uh, make it somewhat hospitable for a lot of those companies to be here. And as I think about going forward, uh, we have to sort of figure out how to get through the immediate period ahead with some of the challenges that are coming with the variants and the mutations. But as we sort of think, again, as I said earlier, uh, looking ahead, I think the large multinationals are going to be an absolutely critical part of partnering with the companies like Vito, Andrevac, Medicago, the other ones that are Canadian entities that are here in this country that partnership is going to be absolutely critical going forward. 